everyone. My name is Amy Keller Laird. I'm the editor in chief of Women's Health Magazine, and we're here tonight to talk about mental illness and busting the stigma around that. It's really become a pillar of Women's Health Magazine. Last year, we partnered with the National Alliance on Mental Illness, which we have a representative from. Thank you so much. Um, and we did a story about the stigma surrounding this, and we really wanted people to come forth and talk about their issues because that's kind of the first step at um, you know busting that stigma. And I talked about my own OCD in that issue, and we had amazing reader support for that. So it's become a, a regular thing that we want to cover. So this May, we did another story, and we kind of formed this panel tonight so that we can have everybody here talking about their journeys along <coughs> the path of different types of mental illness, and really you know, opening it up because we want people to be able to talk about this and get the treatment they need. So we have people here um, from a woman who started an amazing organization for teenage girls, to an Olympic athlete, to someone from NAMI, and as well as Instagram, who's really done some amazing things with tech to help with mental illness. So um, let's go down the row first, and if you guys can introduce yourself and talk a little bit about, you know, what you've done for mental illness. Hi, everyone. My name is Elise Fox. Um, I started a collective for girls who are going through mental illness and depression called Sad Girls Club. I wanted to create a community around mental illness and kind of remove the negative stigma that surrounds it. I felt like there was nothing like that when I was a child, and I wanted to be a voice for people in the future. So I created the club, and join it, please. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Barbara Ritchie. My name is Barbara Ritchie, and I just want to thank Women's Health and Instagram for having this panel and my panel fellow panelists on such an important topic. Um, in my professional life, I'm a managing director at Deutsche Bank, and in my personal life, I'm a mental health advocate, and I'm on the board of NAMI and NAMI New York City Metro. And for those who don't know, NAMI is the nation's largest grassroots organization dedicated to improving the lives of millions of Americans who are affected by mental illness. What have I done? I've had a lot of focus on mental health in the workplace. How, what do you think is the number one cause of disability in the workplace? Can anyone have a guess? It's depression. There are 200 million missed work days a year due to depression. And the irony is that depression is treatable 80% of the time, and yet only a third of people get that help. So that's what I have done, is try to make the workplace more aware. Um, NAMI started a stigma-free company effort, which we partnered with uh, Women's Health on, thank you. And our goal was to foster a culture that supports, promotes, and improves the mental health of their employees and their employees' families. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Carolyn Merrill, and I work at Instagram. I'm on our public policy <coughs> team, and supporting amazing individuals on, in our community who are using their platform to really spread awareness around mental health and build communities is a huge priority for us. And so we're just so thankful to be here and to be working with you guys to just continue that. I'm Alton Schmidt. I'm honored to be here. I am looking to destigmatize the negativity around mental health. And I think a lot of people um, watch the Olympics or watch something on TV and see those was super human, um, but people on TV go through struggles just like every other person in this world. So I'm here to let you know that I have gone through depression, I have gone through struggles, and it's okay to not be okay, but it's also okay to be vulnerable and ask for help. And I started speaking out after my 17-year-old cousin committed suicide in 2015, um, knowing that she was also an athlete um, who we're taught at a young age to not ask for help, just persevere and keep um, pushing through. And if you keep pushing through, you'll get out stronger. Um, I've realized that this is a this game of life is a lot bigger than anything we can get through alone. So it's okay to ask for help, and it's okay to not be okay. Thank you all for introducing yourself. Um, you were talking about depression in the workplace. We recently posted something on Women's Health about pre-existing conditions, and several of our staff members wrote out depression. And we had a lot of support from readers for that, but we also had some people commenting and saying, it's kind of embarrassing that you guys are admitting to this um, as a women's health publication. To me, it's actually, that's the most empowering thing that we are a women's health publication and we can um, admit to these things, and uh, not even admit to these things, just talk about them. But there's still obviously the stigma around it. So we've all talked about the stigma, but why do you think the stigma still exists? Like what's causing 
all doing the same. I personally think that there aren't enough people like in the media or in the spotlight who are talking about it. So it's hard as like a young woman. <laughs> it's hard as a young woman to like find a role model when there aren't people on TV who talk who are talking about it or being interviewed about it or given the platform to speak freely about it. So I think that with this initiative and everything that's going on, we're definitely like moving forward in a positive way by setting examples and letting girls know like I'm not okay, it's cool, let's talk about it and then let's see how we cope with it. And I think that's the best way for recovery. I think stigma exists because the brain is a really complex organ and people are afraid of what they don't understand or they don't know and there's not you know the research on the brain is still rather nascent so I think that contributes to the stigma um, I'd like to highlight that stigma which is a form of discrimination against those that have mental illness it can often be you, you feel that way about yourself too so it's not just somebody else looking at you and stigmatizing you, you might feel like I'm not okay because I'm sick. There's a lot of work to do about brain disease. Um, we're just, why would we talk about something that's negative or why would we talk about something that's looked upon as someone being sad or a different emotion than the happy-go-lucky uh, positive emotion that we're seen as the bright. Um, negative Emotions are always the blue, sad, and positive is always the yellow, happy. Um, so that's what we used to talk about, is yellow, happy. Why do we want to bring back those bad times? But talking about it um, keeps us from isolation, keeps us from thinking that we're alone and we're the only ones going through that. Every person in this world goes through struggles, has emotions from happy, sad, angry. And like I said, it's okay. It's okay to have those different emotions but it's not okay to isolate when you do have the so-called negative emotions. Um, it's not necessarily complaining, it's just allowing yourself to be vulnerable and reach your hand out for help. Yeah, so I think we all kind of touched too a little bit on the internal stigma that people can feel, which is sort of what we focused on in our story this year. Uh, we have a campaign, it's called How I Really Felt, and we asked women to go back to some of the pictures they had actually posted on social media and recaption them. So it was people at parties, oh yeah, we're having a great time. And then when they recaptioned, she was like, I was actually in the middle of a panic attack. I mean, it's this really powerful piece where you see how much people like put up a facade, you know, in order to not show people how they're really feeling. So that's one thing that we at Women's Health are, are trying to get people to do, to go out and recaption their photos in that way. Is there anything else specifically that you haven't mentioned yet that you, you want people to do to take action to help reduce the stigma? I know that within my club, Sad Girls Club, we encourage the girls, not only like on the platform, but like in the comment section, to be supportive of each other. If you're going through something, voice it, vent, like let it out, because that's the best way to heal, in my opinion. And our girls are so supportive that another person, one person will comment, I'm having a roughest day, I don't know how I'm gonna get through this day, and someone else will jump in like, girl, you got this, and you'll get through it. If you need help, you can DM me. And it's kind of created that community and that, and that support system within within the, um, the Instagram page, which is what I really want to do. I want women to remove the mask and like, not just show the perfection, but show like the tears, but just show like the hurt and let's heal together because that's the best way I feel like just to do everything together. So Amy mentioned earlier that Women's Health and NAMI did a survey earlier this year. We surveyed um, 2,000 respondents and 89% of them with depression and anxiety told us that they hid their depression from their friends and at work. So the, the reason they're doing that is threefold. One is stigma, one is fear of repercussion at work, and one is an inability to access quality care. The reason why stigma is so damaging is people feel they're weak and they can't get help. But meanwhile, getting help makes a huge difference. You reduce the amount of time you're suffering, you have better long-term health out outcomes, and in this day and age, you wanna advocate for your own health. So to reduce stigma, just don't be afraid. Ask for help, it's not a sign of weakness. I forgot to say, if anybody has any questions for the panelists, <laughs> uh, be sure to comment on our live stream, and we're gonna try to address them at the end. So sorry, just about it with that really quickly. <laughs> but, back to mental health. Um, <laughs> 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go through each of, with each of you guys and ask some specific questions. Um, I'll start with Elise. Um, why did you decide to talk about your depression at first? Just because no, you said nobody was talking about it, but how did you kind of get the courage up to do that? Oh, so this microphone is the all stars. We're just gonna use this guy. Okay. We're gonna put that one away. Yeah, let's just, yeah, let's, let's. I felt, I just felt like I was pretending for so long. Like I have a pretty good group of friends and we're all supportive of each other. And I felt like I was constantly like, I'm happy in person, but I would go home and just cry and like, go through my emotions alone and I felt like I need a support system. I kind of needed help and I needed assistance and the best way I knew how to do it was through film and my passion. So I decided to do it on a platform as viral as Instagram so I can tell everyone in the same moment, like this is how I'm feeling. I hope this message like gets to girls across the country, across the world who are going through similar things. But I wanted to let girls know that they weren't alone and I wanted to tell my story on the biggest platform. So it's me being completely honest and just removing the mask and removing the perfection that I was kind of giving off initially. Oh. I'm just <laughs> you for one second. Okay. Um, what do you do when you get a negative comment? Because you probably, I mean, you've created this amazing community, but there's still like, you know, the trolls out there. So how do you respond? Do you block them? What do you do? <laughs> Anything that's like super negative, I just try to block it out and delete it so it doesn't kind of tarnish anyone else's opinion of anything or put a, a negative idea in their mind. But if it's something that can be remedied or someone thinks that this, this club won't help me, like joining this club, how is this gonna help? How are these treatments gonna help? I try to talk them into it and like, let them know that we're a community. We're not just here to say like, you can do this one thing or eat this piece of food and it'll make you feel better instantly. It's like, no, we're trying to grow together. We're trying to heal together. So that's what I kind of encourage when someone responds negatively and try to just bring them into the club and not just shun them for saying one bad thing because I'm, I'm, I've been there, I've been negative, I've been the one to post, not to post comments, but just to feel that way, to feel that there's no hope, but I let them know that there is hope, even if you don't see it now, maybe you can see it in the future. Sorry, we're using this one mic, but um, it's making things fun. Um, yes, exactly. Uh, I'm gonna skip Barbara for one second, I wanna come back to you, because I think what you're saying is totally leading into um, Carolyn and what Instagram is doing right now, because you know, social platforms can induce anxiety to curate your life, but Instagram has found ways to actually use technology to help people with mental health. So um, I'm gonna pass it down to you to talk about some of these amazing tools that you guys have curated and why wellness has become such a pillar for Instagram. Awesome, so we actually created a campaign that's called Here For You. Uh, we launched this for Mental Health Awareness Month and Mental Health Awareness Week in the UK, and we, launched a video that was so awesome because one of the one reason because Elise was in it um, but we featured uh, three stories of different community members who were using their platform to really be an example and to create these communities of support on Instagram that you can go there you know you can find someone who is going to be really sharing honestly about their story but also just a place of positivity that you know you can find other people like you and that you aren't alone um, so we did that we shared that with people around the world because this is truly something that is so important to us at Instagram. The reason why we named Here For You twofold, one, because these communities already exist on Instagram and we're just so inspired by them and just wanna lift up those voices because we want to continue to keep Instagram really the safest, kindest platform online. That's really, really important to us. Um, and also because we're here for you and we know that there's Two, two things that to do to solve this. It's one, really lifting up those voices and inspiring, but also creating tools to help, to help protect you. Twofold also for the everyday, everyday person who just wants to you know, have the best tools to say if I wanna block or moderate my comments, et cetera, but then also for friends and family who wanna help people who are navigating mental illness. And so we, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but we actually have tools in our app that if you see something from a friend or family that you is a little distressing or that you, you don't know quite what to do but you want to get them help you can actually tap the three dots at the top um oh that's actually you just can report the content um and say you know i think that my friend needs help i'm not sure and then we have people around the clock who are monitoring this and if they see that it is something that's concerning the next time that person signs on they'll get a little pop-up and we'll connect them with different organizations that are local that they can reach out to. Um, so it's kind of a, a neat thing of pairing tech with 
experts in that space to help solve a, a real world problem in real time. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to Allison now. So you talked a little bit about how Olympic athletes and any elite athlete is sort of, sort of held up on this pedestal, but it's also given you a platform for this. So, how, you know, you decided to speak out um, and what has been the reaction like from your fellow athletes and, and from the community at large? Um, the support has been amazing. The reaction has been really positive. And for me, I mean, eight, gold, eight medals is really cool, but for me, it's... I'm passionate about it. I love to do it, and I happen to be good at it at that level. So. It's not, I mean, anyone can hold my medals, see my medals, and to me, uh, the most important part uh, at the Olympics is the memories and the friendships that I have from there. So if I can use the platform of the medals in a way to um, spread awareness and spread awareness of mental health and mental wellness, which I'm really passionate about, that's, I mean, it makes my, life more worthwhile and makes my days happier that I can use the platform for something good. I'm going to say this without the mic, but did you have anyone, any any friends or fellow Olympic, did you have anyone close to you who reacted negatively? Because I think that's a lot of the worry that people will tell someone, tell a friend, and then find out that that friend's not going to support them. Um, I try and block that out. I guess I, I think that my friends and family have been really supportive, and I've been very fortunate and lucky about that. But I know that there's a lot of people out in the world, um, and I know there's comments out there that are not supportive. And everyone is entitled to their own opinion. Um, and all you can do is educate them. It's not, someone else's words shouldn't get to your heart. Um, reach to those people that are around you, the ones that support you, the ones that will stand with you through anything. And those are the comments that really should mean more to you than the comments of, someone you don't even know that's putting you down. Um, and now, Barbara, if you could talk a little bit about um, the warning signs of, of mental illness, how you know if a loved one has one, um, and if you see someone, you know, a friend is dealing with that, how do you how do you talk to them? How do you refer them to get help? If you go to NAMI.org's website, you will see the 10 common warning signs for mental illness. I break them into three categories behavioral, physical, and emotional. On the behavioral front, if you see changes in your sleep patterns, changes in your eating habits, changes in your sex drive, um, if somebody starts taking really big risks in their life or they're using a lot of alcohol or drugs, those are behavioral signs. Um, physical signs would be having aches and pains, but no obvious physical reason for them. So you have headaches, you have stomach aches. I know when I get anxiety, I get this chest pain here um, pretty much right away. Um, in terms of the emotional signs, it's if you have big mood swings or if you don't perceive reality. Um, of course, if you're feeling down and depressed, if you're anxious, if you're fearful, and suicide is a clear indicator that your thinking is not right and your brain is ill. So if you're feeling these things in yourself, um, the first thing you can do is realize NAMI's motto, you are not alone. One in five people will be impacted by a mental health challenge in any given year. So the prevalency is so high. I would go to a family member or a trusted friend your family doctor, a coach or a teacher, or a faith leader, and confide in them uh, and, and get help from them. Um, I said it earlier, but don't delay in getting help. And then if you see somebody else with these symptoms and you suspect that they need help, um, I will put it into two contexts. One is if they're in extreme distress and they look like they're harming, they could harm her themselves or harm others, you call 911. But if it's a family member or a close friend, there are ways that you can talk to them that are not invading their privacy. Um, you, you should use I statements. 
those are assertive, but they're not accusatory statements. So you could say, I see that you've lost a lot of weight recently, and when we go out to eat, you really pick at your food. I'm concerned about you, are you okay? As opposed to, why are you losing so much weight? You know, you, you don't look good in those clothes anymore, what's going on? You, you just don't want to accuse them. And then if they do start to open up to you, listen. Listen with compassion, don't judge them, and, and offer to help them look for um, resources. Take them to NAMI's website. And my last little tidbit is, if you do have a friend who's sick, sometimes things as simple as just sending them a little text, how are you doing today? Even if they don't respond, it really matters. Great, so now I think we're gonna open it up uh, to some questions that we've gotten from our social audience. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, so this is a question for Barbara. How should I disclose my depression at work? I need to miss days sometimes and I'm worried how they'll react. So this is a very uh, tricky question. And NAMI's official status is think very carefully before you disclose in the workplace. And if you think it's going to negatively impact your job, then you probably should think twice about disclosing. If you're in a position of leadership and it would be helpful to fight the stigma, you may choose to disclose, but you need to know where you stand in the organization before you take that big leap. This one on the back. Okay, this is from uh, uh, Lindsay R-O-Z-E-E. -E. Um, how do you, sorry, if I'm Lindsay Rosie. Okay, how do you help someone who you think may have some mental health issues going on without accusing? I mean, Barbara, you talked to this a little bit, but is there anything else you want to add to that? I think you, you, you kind of answered that at yeah. this point. Um, okay, this is from at, I, I don't know how to pronounce this, so I'm just gonna spell it, uh, Z-Y-R-A-Z-H-Y-T, and thank you guys for using your handles because I think that's important to put yourself out there. Um, what are the causes of mental health issues? There are so many. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the brain is a really unstudied organ. It's very complex. And there can be um, family histories, there can be outside influences. So um, there are many different kinds of mental health conditions, so it's kind of hard to give one exact example. But if you have um, a family history, if, if you have family with um, substance use issues, if you have eccentric relatives, um, those could be signs that maybe if you have a genetic susceptibility to mental health. But it doesn't have to come I think that's a really common question just because I constantly worry, am I gonna get my OCD to my two sons? So I hope not, but you know, you never know. <coughs> um, okay, another question from at Ali underscore Nagel. How do you combat the feeling of fear or vulnerability when you're honest with your friends and your coworkers? Who wants to take that? From personal experience, I think that should definitely disclose the people that you feel close to and comfortable with being your complete self. It, it's a, an extremely nerve-wracking thing to be that open and it's anxiety-filled and it's tough, but if you're in a, in a group of people who love you and support you, you should be able to be totally candid and let them know your story and just ask them for support or let them know exactly what you need and let your voice be heard for the first time. I can say for myself, I was embarrassed, I was ashamed, um, and I didn't want to tell anyone, um, but once I did, it was a weight lift off my chest. And it didn't, it took a few times, it took almost four months of me going to see a psychologist to finally admit to the public, to finally admit to my family that, and friends, that I was going to see a psychologist rather than just having an appointment, having a doctor's appointment. Um, but now that I have let people know the support has been tremendous and it's a weight left, lifted off my chest and off my shoulders and I'm allowed to uh, live more freely. I think one thing we reported in our women's health story last year that really helped me like put my head around it was that 
mental illness is like physical illness. You, if you have diabetes, you take diabetes medications, you get treatment. That's the same for mental illness. And I think that's a really hard concept for people who do not have a mental illness or someone in the family to grasp onto. But like once you can get your head around that idea and get people to understand that, that's what all the doctors said, that like you have to manage it. You know, whether it's changes in the brain or it's environmental things that are triggering it, it's still a disease like a physical disease and people have less stigma toward those. So that was one thing that helped me. But um, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but this is from Enhance Your Health with Jennifer. Can you, how do you deal with self-care for a family member who is living with a uh, mental health issue? This is an area at NAMI that we've been spending more and more time on. We just released a report last year called On Pins and Needles about the caregiver issue. There can be secondary stigma for the caregiver. Um, there's definitely increased levels of stress for the caregiver. And um, around 70% of the caregivers, and this is an unpaid person who helps a family member or friend, 70% of them are women. And almost two thirds of those women work outside of the home. So you really need to take care of your own health Put the supports in place if you're a caregiver. It's really important. Great. Well, thank you so much, all of you, for coming here, talking about your own issues and all of the great information you have. Um, everybody out there, we've got our handles back here. Feel free to join the conversation. Reach out to any of us. Um, we are here for you, as Instagram would say. And uh, thank you so much for joining this conversation.